Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here's your host, Joe Kuzma. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Joe Kuzma, and I'm once again flying so low. I think Brian's gone into hiding, and you know what? Who can blame him when you're looking dead in the face right now of what could be the Pittsburgh Steelers season as they travel to Baltimore, another road game here, another AFC North division game as they go to take on the 8-3 and three Baltimore Ravens. It looks big. It looks scary. Lamar Jackson has been a league MVP already in his short tenure in the NFL, and I I have to tell some folks that just gravely panicked from last week. Yes, everyone else in the AFC North has improved. I actually think the Bengals may have improved more than I was expecting them to, to be completely honest. On the other hand, the Cleveland Browns, maybe maybe we got those two flipped, to be completely honest, is kind of where I thought the Bengals would be, but I thought everybody would be competitive And I looked at the Ravens, and this was pre all the injuries that they sustained this offseason and even heading into training camp in the beginning of the season. They had quite a few bodies have gotten hurt, and everybody looks across the division and they go, well, why isn't Mike Tomlin doing this? You know, Joe and all you other folks that are making excuses for injuries and people on COVID list and replacing players, look at what the Ravens are doing. And immediately comes to mind the game, exactly what I thought would might happen in this upcoming game. Maybe the ship has sailed. And maybe we don't get to Lamar Jackson on Sunday that throws four interceptions as he did against the Browns on Sunday night. But that's the type of player, and that's the type of play the Ravens have been getting away with. Nine turnovers in the last four games. Folks, I'm, I hate to say, you know, th- there could be a chance here. Obviously, the Steelers, particularly on the defense, well, every side of the ball, let's face it, we haven't expected a whole lot from the offense, but if we're going to expect anything like a close game that the Steelers can eke out and stay in this, the defense is going to have to play a hell of a lot better in order to get the offense to, is the offense capable of scoring 20-some points? We saw them put up that much in one quarter, and it's like, whoa, is this an aberration? Chargers defense, not very good, obviously. Ravens defense isn't quite what it used to be either. So there's some opportunities here. It's not all doom and gloom. And you take a look at, yeah, the Steelers, man, they rip off four straight wins, looking pretty good. You're getting into an area where you got the Detroit Lions. It's exactly what I felt. I'm like, these are teams that can beat that have some bad defenses. The Lions, the Chargers, you get in a shootout. You lose by four to the Chargers. You tie the Lions. You don't have Ben Roethlisberger. You lose all kind of other guys. Najee Harris takes a a series out. TJ Watt heads to the sideline. There's just some, like, really sad things that occur throughout the season. I tweeted out. Jeez, I didn't even realize this is something that's going to be more of an off-season thing. I went on a pretty epic rant already on the last show, and I kind of want to stay focused on just previewing this game in particular. But if I could find it here, you talk about all the names that the Steelers replaced from last season. Uh, James Conner at running back. I'd argue Najee Harris every bit is good. That's fine. And also getting Friar Muth for Vance McDonald, but we're still talking veteran players. Marquise Pouncey, Alejandro Villanueva, David DeCastro, and Matt Filer for the five on the offensive line, which we didn't feel was very good. I think if the Steelers had the cap space, they probably would have kept Matt Filer. At the very least, they weren't expecting to lose David DeCastro, so that's why you got to pick and choose. That's why guys like Chris Wormley, knock on wood, that they did bring him back. Cam Sutton, same difference there, but that PO'd Steven Nelson, who heard that Cam Sutton's going to get an opportunity to maybe start, and he wanted out. And that hurts your secondary along with the higher-priced free agents like Mike Hilton and Bud Dupree. They released and then re-signed Vince Williams, and then he decided to retire. Steelers lost Juju Smith-Schuster during this tenure. Tyson Alualu, Stefan Tuitt has yet to see the field. We're talking about 12 or 13 starters. You only get 11 on each side of the ball, 22 each. Yeah, you could probably say like a nickel corner, an extra wide receiver or somebody like that. You could stretch it a little bit, but still, 12-13, we're talking half 
with offense defense that you're replacing. And when you take that out a little bit further, Eric Ebron's on IR now. He had already missed three games going up until being placed on injured reserve this week. Joe Hayden, hope to see him back on the field. He has missed three games as well over this uh, period of time. Let's see, TJ Watts missed two. He's on the COVID list right now. You got to hope that he's available for Sunday because, man, you need all hands on deck. Chase Claypool's missed two, and then you have a plethora of players. Ben Roethlisberger, Deontay Johnson, James Washington, Micah Fitzpatrick, Cam Sutton, Devin Bush, Alex Highsmith, and Robert Splain all missing at least one game in addition to that. So you take those other 12, 13 players I mentioned in the first group, and you add, let's see, one, two, three players here. There's 11 games, so that's about a third of what they've played. Uh, there's another two. You're up to like 15, TJ Watt and Claypool, the bona fide stars, especially Watt. You get out to like 16 players, all the other ones. You could replace a player here or there, okay? Maybe you get some depth here here, here or there. Um the problem with the Steelers is when you're talking about some of the replacements, you've got Najee Harris, Pat Fryermuth, they're both rookies. Those are the guys that I've always felt you got to hitch the wagon to. Kendrick Green and Dan Moore, third round and a fourth round rookie on the line. Isaiah Lauder-Milk, a sixth round rookie in and out, uh, but still a contributor. Trey Norwood's been contributing, a seventh round rookie. James Pierre, an undrafted player, albeit he's been around a couple years. Akella Witherspoon, Carl Joseph. Uh, Anthony Miller, Taco Charlton, and Derek Tuska are all players who joined this team following training camp. And then there are still other guys like um, uh, Mondau that I didn't even mention right now. I like C99 in my head. I want to call him Brett Kiesel. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you can only have a standard for so long. It's, uh, re- it's really tough. And what can you do to fix some of this? I'm not sure. We're going to have to see, uh, Joe Haig lands on the COVID list as far as your updates, and Ray Ray McLeod comes off of it, but then Robert Spillane goes back on. TJ Watt was on on the 29th. There is an opportunity that he could play, but Robert Spillane going on that list yesterday means he's going to be out more than likely for Sunday. Uh, I believe it's two tests. Got to be two tests within, uh, was it 24 hours each? Uh, I'll be honest, I, I'm not keeping as close a count on that as uh, maybe some. So let's see. Uh, your injury report for this game. And then I'll get into some more specifics. I mean, Ben Roethlisberger was the usual Wednesday off, full practice. Chase Claypool back to full practice. Joe Hayden, still a DNP with that foot. Not getting him on the field is not good. Now, the Ravens, they don't have necessarily the strongest passing attack. They don't have the, they don't have the horses in the stable that the Bengals do. But they still have enough there to do some damage. And with the way Lamar Jackson extends plays, he throws balls into danger sometimes, but sometimes that's the risk-reward. And they live and die by that sword. They've been living on the high hog right now. Uh, The long snapper Christian Kuntz actually showed up with a hip injury, but he has practiced both days. Trey Turner was just a coach's decision, so he looks good to go. Uh, Zach Banner came down with a non-COVID-related illness, so we'll see. He hasn't been able to practice. I know he hasn't been on the field a whole lot. Some people fielding questions as to whether why why isn't he out there. Well, I don't think they want to disrupt – even as bad as the offensive line play has been, it could be worse. You're trying to get some type of continuity there. You might be able to switch out one spot, which is just my argument of, can Banner play a left tackle? That isn't where they originally had him penciled in at uh, either time. They wanted Chooks to be over there this year before Banner didn't really make the recovery and started out on IR for the season. So... Do you move Chooks back? Do you move him over to left halfway through? What six games left, and then Banner to the right, and then you might have some more problems. And, and then we still got Kevin Dotson and uh, J.C. Hassenauer out. So you, you're you've got patchwork here with the left guard position already. It, it puts it puts everyone in a really difficult spot, having to just. Uh, jumble and and mix and match these pieces, wh- whether they're good pieces or bad pieces. It's it's just. It's just something that I don't see, I don't foresee happening unless somebody 
God forbid someone else gets hurt. It'll probably be a groin injury, knowing our knowing the luck here, right? Uh, Pat Fryermuth has been practicing. He was in the concussion protocol. Arthur Millette, quadricep injury, shows up on the Thursday report as a DNP. Got to hope he's available because they're really thin on defensive backs right now in that secondary. Isaiah Bugs limited practice. Uh, that was the big news this week was a change in the depth chart, which is pretty rare. Bugs dropped down to the second team. Have you seen the contraption on his arm? And uh, he was inactive, I believe, the week before, uh, one of the two weeks before. So uh, Mondal slides in there as the nose tackle, and that's that's been kind of the problem here, I think, with the Steelers. But get to that in one second. It's been that defense. It's been the front seven in that defensive line. My goodness, the Baltimore Ravens have their teams on this injury report. Go look at it. It's over at Steelers.com if you click on team on injury report. Anthony Everett, Miles Boykin, limited. Nick Boyle, tight end, DMP for two days. Uh, Bradley Bozeman, the center, is back to full practice, as is Calais Camel was in concussion protocol. He did not play against the Browns. That's a guy you got to watch out for. Uh, that's one where the Ravens made that trade, and it's like it's the arms race in the AFC North, right? You got TJ Watt, you got Miles Garrett, you got Calais Camel. This is a guy I wish wasn't on this roster. That's how highly I will speak of Calais Camel. Uh, Devin Duvernay, uh, limited practice. He's also a, uh, a special teams returner. Justin Houston just had a day off with rest. And he's been kind of floating back and forth. Uh, one of the sack artists, of course, he snubbed the Steelers, and that's why they went with Melvin Ingram. And, yeah, he would like some revenge game here. Patrick McCarry, this is an interesting one here because they're trying to work him out as a left tackle in place of Ronnie Stanley. He's on the injury report. He didn't practice Wednesday and also limited Thursday. They need him to pretty much go. Uh, uh, Cedric Obuche. Uh, did not practice. He's uh, he's not a starter, but one of the reserve tackles. Patrick Queen, back to practice. He was limited with ribs on Wednesday. Patrick Ricard, fullback, did not practice this week yet. Jimmy Smith, limited and full with a neck injury. I'm not done yet. <laughs> Chris Westry, a corner. Tavon Young, a corner. Both of them. Uh, DNPs, although Tavon Young, one of their nickel corners, his is an illness. Two more players with illnesses now. Jalen Ferguson, outside linebacker, limited Thursday. Marlon Humphrey is a do not practice on Thursday. Uh, Odafe Owe also shows up with a shoulder injury, DMP on Thursday. And then Alejandro Villanueva and Brandon Williams. Uh, we know Villanueva, Brandon Williams, another one of these stud defensive tackles. They both just received a day of rest. But holy cow. And and most of this is leg like legitimate stuff. This isn't like the the BS where Bill Belichick has to list somebody just because it's the NFL protocols. But you could tell um, th this is benefiting the Steelers that the Ravens did play the Browns. I kind of wish they would have played in Cleveland. This is actually setting up very nice for Cleveland next week if the Steelers can play a physical game against the Ravens. But it also sets up poorly for the Steelers to go on a short week for Thursday night football to the Minnesota Vikings on the road. <laughs> All these road games, man, just uh, – well, I'm sorry. Um, not on the – well, on the road in Minnesota, uh, at home in Pittsburgh here this week. So the Ravens what, – what I meant to say was I wish the Ravens would have had two consecutive road games. They go – they played in Baltimore la um, last Sunday night. They go to Cleveland after this, and the Browns have a bye this week. So it's setting up pretty nicely when you talk about the game after a Baltimore Ravens and Pittsburgh Steelers game. These two teams are usually banged up, and the opponents get an advantage. That means the Vikings in Minnesota, Thursday night short week against the Steelers. That means the Cleveland Browns short week, or not short week, but uh, Sunday in Cleveland at their building in First Energy Stadium. So... Don't be surprised if both of these teams look like crap when we get over to week 14. Week 13, though, the Steelers might still look like crap, and I don't really know what kind of Ravens team we're going to get either. You've got injuries, you've got COVID lists, and all of these things. The way I say this might set up nicely for the Steelers is, uh, even though the Ravens had had their home game, believe it or not, the, ro uh, the home games do help. They help you with the travel and the rest and being prepared and making sure – 
you have all your big guns. The, the AFC North, it's not very long trips or anything like that. And even you saw in the case of if you really want somebody to be there, fly Ben Roethlisberger on a private plane out to L.A. to play the Chargers. So, But I think you get my sentiments there. Uh, it's nice to be at home. You should have a home crowd. Hopefully, people haven't bailed on Pittsburgh yet and bailed on this season because they're still they're still in the meat of this. There's still enough mediocre football to go around in the AFC North that five five and one, uh, maybe maybe they could do something. They had a couple guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna say a lot of most of the people are picking the Ravens, and I don't blame them. After you saw what the Steelers did last Sunday against the Bengals, how can you pick them to win any games the remainder of the year? I'm forever the optimist, and even I can tell you that much. It's very difficult to go out there, but I'm going to say there are some opportunities here. Pete Prisco points out some good stuff from CBS Sports. He has the Steelers by 3, 23-20, which would be an interesting score. This has become a great rivalry, known for physical play. But the Steelers have hardly looked physical the past two weeks. They're struggling in a big way. Yes, they are, defensively. And a lot of that injuries and guys that are just lost. Can't do that against any NFL team. And this is the division leader. But anyways, they're struggling in a big way while the Ravens are coming off a tough home victory over Cleveland. Even so, the Ravens' offense isn't good right now. That's a point I'm about to make. The Steelers will find a way to win this late, playing in a survival game. Uh, also, John Breach, who's with CBS, has the Steelers by three. At 5-5-1, five, five, and one, the Steelers' season basically hangs in the balance this week. If they lose, they're definitely not winning the AFC North, and they're not, and they're likely not making the playoffs. I do not like to pick against desperate teams, especially when they're playing at home against a division rival. Both of these things are true. They've got to get a win in the AFC and in the AFC North in order to stay in the thick of these things. Um, there's seven playoff spots now, so, so two teams coming out of the North isn't impossible. It's still not impossible that the Browns sneak into this thing, too, and into this conversation, even though they're kind of behind and the Steelers have the advantage with the tiebreaker. They'll play them. They still, The Steelers will still have yet another meeting with the Ravens and another meeting with the Browns coming up. One at least uh, out of these three games that are coming up, they're one and two in the division. I was hoping for at least a three and three split. Two games, they, maybe they win. So you're at seven wins. I think they got to get to at least nine, definitely ten. I said ten can win this division. If ten wins this division, though, do the other teams in the division make the playoffs? There'll be three other spots. you got the four division winners. It's very hard to say. I mean, you've got so many teams muddled in the middle of this, like the Raiders. And now the Patriots have come on and the Bills. And you're looking at this whole picture. The Broncos are in there somewhere, too. Steelers got in the Chargers, and you've got Steelers don't have the, any tiebreaker or head to head over the Chargers, but they do over the Broncos, and all of these things are going to play out. And they still get the Titans, and they still get some of these teams where maybe they could advance and move uh, up and down the ladder here. It's just, wow, it'll be really tough. Uh, I, I think it, it would be if they dropped this game. They definitely. They definitely, I said last week was the must win. I thought last week was going to be the easier path than uh, even Baltimore, even Baltimore at home. But they won't, uh, the Steelers, this is good too. Mark Sessler from NFL Network says the Steelers appear cooked, but they're also a desperate operation clinging to life under an agitated coach and Mike Tomlin. They know the Ravens better than anyone. Baltimore is no gem either handing the ball away nine times over the past four games. I just said that. <laughs> the Steelers won't appreciate being labeled as a dogs at home against the hated foe, expect them to come out with a fevered look in the eye. I would hope so. It's also important to note that John Breach from CBS Sports, I'll give him uh, this stat that I didn't know. The Steelers are 1-1 one and one against Lamar Jackson, and typically uh, they've deployed different looks against him. It's going to be tough when you don't have Tyson Alou or a Stephon Tuitt up front in order to stop uh, Lamar Jackson and the Greg Roman's offense, even with Devonta Freeman, it's, it's, I mean, it's not the same, but it's still run first and it's run heavy. And the Steelers couldn't stop Alex Collins. They gave up big runs to these Lions running backs. The one was back up. You saw Joe Mixon put up career numbers last week. And then it's Lamar Jackson. And somehow you got to spy him. And with no Joe Hayden, you got to hope that somewhere on the field is covered and you don't have somebody squeak by James Pierre like a Sammy Watkins. He's a, he's a wily veteran. Well, he might not be wily, but he's a veteran. You know what I'm saying? He knows the tricks. He knows the trades. He's still a, a solid player. That's why he's there. 
um, the rookie, Rashad Bateman. And that guy scares me. He hasn't been on the field a whole lot. He, he got a late start, but it's a guy that they brought in that has a pretty decent rapport with Lamar Jackson. You've got Mark Andrews, who's a stud tight end. You, you saw the Steelers have shut down tight ends this year. So, and Mark Andrews, uh, I've kept a pretty keen eye on because he's been on my fantasy teams. I watch a lot of the AFC North football. I usually watch most of it, uh, three quarters of it throughout the year. So uh, Mark Andrews can get the job done. Something's been a little out of sync here or there too with him, but still dangerous, still dangerous. It's not somebody I want to downplay or discount. I'm just saying when they throw the ball to Hollywood Brown, on the other hand, you don't know if the guy's going to catch the ball or not. He's a 2020 version of Deontay Johnson right now who – you can throw it right at the numbers, and the guy's gonna just drop it out the bread basket. So, I, I this is and this is where else I'm looking at. Okay, you've got uh, the Ravens have won some close games. So eight and three. I don't know that their record reflects who they are. And I might catch some heat for this. I catch heat for a lot of things I put on the website or say here. When I'm looking at the ASC and the Baltimore Ravens is the number one seed. There is nobody on the television saying that the Ravens are the worst team, or worst eight and three team in football, or the worst eight win team in football. You've got Tennessee at eight wins, eight and four, New England at eight and four. I don't know that any of these records hold, by the way, with the Patriots or the Titans. Kansas City's coming back on at seven and four. You look over at the NFC. And you got the Cowboys who have been rough. Talk about injuries and how they could mess with a team. Look at them defensively, offensively. The same type of thing going on. You look at the Saints with the quarterback situation. These things aren't exclusive to the Steelers, but you could see how they could change the dynamic of your season. And it's it's not an excuse. It's just the guys that you got weren't the guys you were planning on going into battle with. And... Now, all of a sudden, instead of having a team that you felt was a 10-win Pittsburgh Steelers team, if you look, if I looked at this, some of this roster in some of these games at the beginning of the season this year, I'd say, man, it'd be hard to see how they could be 500. And then that's why you see a tie game against the Detroit Lions, for example. It's, it, it's really subjective. But the Ravens, the reason I say this about the Ravens is just because everyone and their brother said this about the Browns last – or the Browns uh, – you know, everybody had the Browns as Super Bowl champions preseason. Let's be clear on that. Not to needle the Browns some more, but the Steelers as an 11-win team last year and undefeated, they were the worst. Oh, my God, the worst undefeated team ever, ever in the history of the NFL. And that last game that they had played was against the Ravens, and that was a real just sloppy 1914 game on a Wednesday at 340 kickoff. Um, what Trace McSorley was the quarterback. He had all kind of people missing on both sides of the ball, and they they bang each other around. And then all of a sudden, the Steelers have to play a five o'clock Monday game against uh, the Washington Football Team, and that was their first loss. And then it goes off the rails from there. Obviously, um, as we all remember, and you got to hope they get back on the rails. But why is no one pointing out what's going on with the um, with the Ravens? Okay, they lost an OT to the Raiders. They win by a point over the Chiefs. They got four wins by a field goal or less. Well, another one was the Detroit Lions at the beginning of the season here. They they win by two points off of Justin Tucker and the longest field goal in NFL history that bounces off the crossbar and goes through the uprights. Uh, they handed the Broncos 23-7. to They win an OT against the Colts, another overtime game, 31-25. They handled the Chargers 34-6. to They lost to the Bengals. Big. Same thing, 41-17. They head into the bye week and then go into another over three overtime games this year, by the way, and they've won two of them. Here's another one, three points against the Vikings, 34-31. They lose to the Miami Dolphins in Miami, 22-10, and then they've struggled 16-13 against the Bears and then 16-10 Sunday against the Browns. They get those Ws. There will probably be a little less complaining in Steeler Nation if – there were more check marks in the win column. If the Steelers had that, if they had that win critical against the Lions, they'd be six and five. Maybe a little less complaining going on, perhaps. Maybe if they pull out that game with the Chargers at the end, don't give up that big touchdown. Maybe they're a seven win team 
and now you're complaining a little bit less and liking their fortunes a little more in this game. But that's the point I'm trying to illustrate. That doesn't change the dynamic of this game. The record doesn't necessarily change. It indicates maybe what your team is sometimes. Let's not get it twisted. But when you're looking at the dynamic of who's on the field and how close some of the Ravens games have been to being losses and how some of these close games with the Steelers have been to be wins, Green Bay Packers game, I keep looking at that 10-point swing with the botched referee call and the blocked kick return for a field goal, or if not field goal, but the field goal attempt return for a touchdown, Mick Fitzpatrick. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you. <sighs> Am I that optimistic about this? It's it's in Pittsburgh. So maybe, unlike last week, if they get scored on first or something, maybe, maybe they're not as down in the dumps. The, the whole emotions riding high. I mean, they had the Cincinnati, a rabid Cincinnati crowd that I've never seen that stadium as full as it's been in the handful of times I've been there over the last 10 years, going back to Andy Dalton and T.O. and that. Not even then. Usually these games are like in November, December, and it's cold, and people are like, eh, the Bengals suck, I'm not showing up, or they still didn't get behind the team. Uh, they were behind this team, and that will do something to you mentally too. And when you're making all these other mistakes, compounds, I said this somewhere in the comments section. It may have even been on YouTube or over at SteelCityUnderground.com, but I said, here we go again. As long as they don't get here we go again, th this is the thing. And I think this is the this is the same thing the fans, you and I are thinking this, here we go again. All right? And it's a terrible play on the, the hashtag and the saying, here we go, but there it is. Here we go again. They gotta If they could get out of that hamster wheel of the here we go again and break that and say no, this isn't going to happen again, and we're going to do this. Maybe, maybe some of the the philosophy changes. They've still got six games to make a statement on this season. We'll see if it's a good statement or a bad or a bad one. Um, some other key notes about this game. Let's see here. The Ravens are three and two on the road. So almost like a 500 team. They're four and seven against the spread. So even though they're being picked, uh, let's see. I'm going to bring up the actual line on this game because I know that they were laying some points here. We got the uh, the Steelers getting four and a half. So the Ravens actually favored on the road in Pittsburgh. Like I said, people aren't going to like that. Teams, that's bulletin board material, right? 44 is the over-under, so maybe 20 points a piece at best, or it's going to be another blowout. <laughs> Hopefully not the latter. But when you're taking a look at this, um, the Ravens haven't been good at taking the ball away. They've been giving it away. They're 28th. They're a minus 7. The Steelers are 22nd. They're not far off, but they're a minus 4. So they've given it up uh, th or taken it away, whatever, three less times here. Uh, the Ravens are right in the middle of the pack, scoring, averaging almost 24 points per game. They're 15th in the league. They are ninth in points allowed with 21.8. The Steelers have been scoring uh, 20.4, which is 22nd, and allowing 24.3, which is 23rd. Those have been the major differences, and that's been skewed huge by the last two games, uh, by the way, where the defense getting torched for points, even when they were – Pretty bad. We're talking Jarvis Jones, can't stop the run type bad when he's on the edge. They still were giving up like 19, 19, po 19 points, something like that. It wasn't even 20 points the defense was. So um, let's see here. Apologies for my coffee break. I was actually doing pretty well without that. But uh, Ravens are 13th in pass game. They're right there in the in the thick of things with the Steelers, believe it or not. We're talking 13th and 15th in the league. 242 per game to the Steelers, 238. Those are almost identical numbers, and that's kind of hard to believe, and that's kind of what I just said with the whole James Pierre and people getting lost type thing. Ravens are second in the league with 150 uh, run, uh, yards on the ground per game. The Steelers are still near the bottom at 28th with 87 per game, and they don't even attempt to run it last week at all. We'll see if that changes at all, but the Ravens are also second defensively when it comes to stopping the run, but they're dead last and pass. They're 275. Hard to believe when you got Marlon Humphrey, who is just a beast of a player, all-pro level player, 
We'll see what ends up happening here. Can the Steelers get that done? The Steelers defensively have been 12th and 28th. They are near the bottom against the run. They have got to stop the run. If all the Ravens do is run the football and the script plays out the way it has the last several games, they're toast. They're not going to be able to stop anything. The Ravens are going to chew up clock, time of possession. The defense is going to be tired. And if the offense does their three and out crap, you know, the fat lady may as well sing. Hopefully it's not by halftime like we've seen in the last couple of games. We'll see if some of this changes. And, of course, got to find out some status maybe like on TJ Watt, see what ends up happening. Uh, I'm going to take a quick look here before I let all of you go and see if there's uh, anything else on the news wire here. But you're probably wondering um, what is my position on this game well, it's 425, so it's not quite the prime time, but it'll be one of these games that are highlighted almost as a prime time. Most of the country is going to get the watch. You're going to get a lot of strong opinions regardless of how this thing goes. So when you come out of this on the other side, I'm going to say it's probably going to define most of what the Steelers are going to do because if they don't get this win, it's going to be tough to turn around, come back, go on the road Thursday night and beat the Vikings after you have this slugfest with the Ravens that you hopefully come out of uh, moderately healthy and maybe even get somebody like Joe Hayden or something back on the short week. you got to get somebody else there on the field. You follow that up at home against the Titans. you got the Chiefs and the Browns-Ravens. Um, it's not that I don't think that the Ravens-Vikings or Titans are beatable, but if they get trounced by the Ravens, I mean, Vikings are going to be without Dalvin Cook. Titans are without uh, Derrick Henry. That's at least a feather in the Steelers' cap because then it's like stick a fork in them. I think those are still winnable matchups. We'll see. Chiefs on the road the day after Christmas, that's that's a tough one. And depending on how the Steelers' backs are up against the wall, uh, there's no telling how they might play or show up for that one. But I still think the AFC North football games are ones that could be winnable. you got Monday Night Football against the Browns, which then you got to go back to a Sunday at 1 o'clock and go on the road to Baltimore. Jeez, yeah. So I, sometimes the schedule uh, favors you, sometimes it doesn't. And in this case, it's kind of topsy-turvy. And if you get a team like the one that played against Cincinnati last week, well, that's not going to be a whole lot. Steelers defense, I mentioned wide receivers. I mentioned Devonta Freeman. I mentioned, uh, not really mentioned, Latavius Murray. For some reason, Tyson Williams is in the doghouse. I thought he had done okay. They may not have their full back. We'll see how that ends up turning out. And as far as the offensive line, some of these guys, like I said, Patrick McCarry is playing as a tackle now. Uh, Kevin Zeitler and Alejandro Villanueva are the big veterans there. Bradley Bozeman is uh, new working out as the center, uh, at least for this season. And then Ben Powers ended up taking that left guard position where many thought it might have been Ben Cleveland originally. So the Ravens offensive line is kind of shape shift, uh, kind of makeshift as well. The thing that happens, though, is, is that you know, you don't necessarily get to Lamar Jackson. Um, he's been sacked 30 times, but a lot of that is he's already running around. That's more times than Ben has. But it's again, it's because he's like kind of sometimes almost taking it like a direct snap. It, it's tough to bring him down and make sure he doesn't make any type of dynamic plays. He has 12 picks on the air to 15 touchdowns. So there is some opportunity there. Ben is still 14 touchdowns to six interceptions. He's thrown for 2,522 yards, where Lamar is thrown for 26-12. So as far as if you take Lamar Jackson and his run game factor out of this and force him to just be a quarterback, and the Steelers have done that, this was the point I wanted to make from the jump, and this is the one I'm going to end with for sure. And I'm trying to find me... Where did my Steelers depth chart go? Because I don't think it really matters. But I started to go there, and it's you've got Cam Hayward who's having um, a career milestone year. If you don't have T.J. Watt, that's that's going to be huge. Chris Wormley's been okay against the run, but missing Tyson Alualu is definitely hurt. You're not going to have that three-man front with the two outside linebackers and then the two inside backers. Somebody's got to eat up one of these offensive linemen here so they just don't stick to Joe Schobert or Devin Bush like a magnet. Because if or when that happens, and this team also using multiple tight ends and fullbacks, they're going to take the DBs out of this game too, and long runs are going to be a thing, and it's going to be ugly. 
so you got to hope they put the pads on. They only had three padded practices left. Now they'll have two. You got to hope maybe you get those pads popping. They're working on some things here. I need Alex Highsmith to step up. It's not that he's been terrible. It's not that he's been bad at all. It's just been kind of middle ground. I want to see him have a good game. If Taco Charlton has to get in there, got to stop the run. I, I just, I just keep. You got to do everything you got. Cross everything you have. Fingers, toes, knock on wood. I don't know what else can you do uh, for good luck. Rabbit's feet. Flip a coin. Don't pick up pennies that are uh, face down to get TJ Watt on the field because he's going to be the game changer for this one. My other obvious concern is too is we saw some poor tackling and poor play from James Pierre. He's got to bounce, bounce back. Arthur Millette sick. What do you do if you don't have Arthur Millette and you're down Joe Hayden too? Because typically you might throw Pierre on the outside when Hayden was there and slide Cam Sutton in. Now you've got Trey Norwood and James Pierre probably on the field at the same time, and that is just tough. Now the Steelers did something else. that um, they, Was this the last time? It might not have been. This might be going back yet another season to 2019. But they had played with five linebackers on the field. Uh, that might mean an extra outside linebacker, which we've seen that look a little bit. Melvin uh, Ingram was out there with Watt and Highsmith. And we also saw that look, uh, I want to say, last week against the Bengals. I think Taco might have been out there. It was only like a snap or two. But before it was like maybe Vince Williams and Robert Spillane and Devin Bush, something like that. And you got three inside linebackers effectively. So that second level – You've still got another guy that the Ravens got to account the block for, right? That's what I'm talking about is moving up past that defensive line into the linebacker tier there. And I don't know. They may not have the personnel for this either because, like I said, Robert Spillane may be out. We haven't seen Marcus Allen play all year except for special teams. And Buddy Johnson, the rookie, he hasn't played. Ulysses Gilbert, you might as well just say he hasn't played at all in in the few years he's been in the league special teams this year, but this is what you might, can you count on that type of game plan to slow down the Ravens run game? I'm not sure it works the same way here. So we'll find out folks. Maybe Isaiah Loudermilk gets out there. Maybe we'll see what he does, but then he's got it had to been in the rotation. That's the other thing that kind of hurts. You talk about Lou Lou. He's not just the nose tackle, but he's the guy that was giving breaks and giving rest for Cam Hayward and Stefan to it. So you lose to it and you lose a Lou Lou. And now you've got Warmly, who has basically just had to be a defensive end. They can't just have him play as a tackle-type spot. Bugs hasn't been able to get in there. Mondale was a practice player. It's tough, and it could be ugly. And there's nobody, before I go, you can't blame anybody about this. How can you, how can you plan for these type of injuries? There's only so many bodies you can put on the 53-man roster. It's not like you're stuffing all-stars and former Pro Bowl players on the practice squad. It's just it, it's just the way these things go, and unfortunately, they have went this way. So try and keep your chin up, keep your chest out. We're going to see if the Steelers got a little bit of something extra there, a little heart, a little something in the tank, maybe that X factor, maybe being at home, maybe to keep it close, maybe the fans go nuts, harass the Ravens, and, and maybe there's something just extra there that happens. Maybe there's splash plays. Maybe the Steelers protect the football. Maybe they could run the football against the Ravens. I wouldn't necessarily count on that. And, and I haven't seen any willingness when it comes to the play calling or maybe whatever Ben might check out of. I got to wonder sometimes, too, and I mentioned this, I think, on the last show. It's like you talk about Matt Canada play calls. You could tell when there's a bad play call versus maybe a bad decision. Maybe Ben checks out of a run to a pass, or maybe he locks into a certain receiver. And sometimes I just think he goes, "Wow, well, I'm taking this over, and I'm going to try and do it all, on, put it all on my back." And that's not always. It's been good. There's been many, many times where we are singing and dancing and everything else after a game, and we're we're happy. Ben, game-winning drive, classic vintage Ben Roethlisberger. And then there's the times like last week where you don't get the same thing there. So it's tough. I mean, how do you get away from that? The guy's been around, what, like 18 seasons, 30, 39, going on 40? Uh, you know, you owe it to him. You almost uh, uh, owe it to him, right? Uh, you, you can count on that maybe. And it's just sometimes it's not going to pan out the way you would like. So, folks, I'm going to put a bow on this episode. 
if you're headed out to Heinz Field, be loud, get crazy. Um, hopefully some decent weather also. So I did not get a chance to look. I got one last thing because, you know, it'll bug me if I don't know who the referee is for this game. Scott Novak. Yeah, not the not the worst, but he's trending. <laughs> he's getting up there. I want to say they had Scott Novak earlier this year because uh, that really strikes a, a bell with me. At least it's not Tony Corrente. That's not the guy I want to see uh, on the field. Yeah, this was the guy. This was the guy's crew blew the Packers call. I was just talking about earlier. So you get him again. Uh, but overall, the penalties, there was only eight total in the game. His crew isn't a double-digit uh, flag-tossing type. Uh, so at least you got that going, in, uh, maybe going in the Steelers' favor. We'll see how that ends up going. So uh, thank God it's not Cleet Blakeman or Tony Corrente. So let's put a bow on it now that I got the Zebras out of the way. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. As always, my name's Joe Kuzma, and we encourage all Everyone out there, as always, especially during this holiday season, to be safe, be good, and we'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com.